in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said... If you're not careful, you look at Acts chapter 13 and you read through it just like I read through it. And you're like, okay, let's move on. John left. But if you were to understand the history of what took place, this young man, John Mark, left Paul and Barnabas at the worst time ever. They'd just gone through some craziness. They, they had a confrontation with a man named Bar Jesus, completely demon possessed. And there was all this demonic manifestation. There's this craziness happening. And here they are, and they arrive at this point, and John Mark says, I'm out. And in this brief, in this brief moment, as we read through this scripture, if you're not careful, you miss what's really happening. Let me tell you what happened. In the worst moment possible. John Mark abandoned Paul and Barnabas. He deserted them. Somebody that had great responsibility, somebody that was a helper in their ministry that they were dependent upon, deserted them in the moment of great crisis. We look at people that have failed in the past. Every single one of us have experienced failure. Every one of us have experienced failure. But this morning, I want to focus on a young man named John Mark and how God used him, his failures, his problems, his dysfunction, and made him one of the greatest evangelists that we've seen in Scripture. As a matter of fact, brought forth out of his life incredible fruit that still remains today. In order to understand the story of John, we have to look at his backstory. John Mark, the first time we see this young man, John Mark, it's a very unusual moment. I want to just kind of let me tell you a story. Can I tell you a story how this happened? Let me kind of tell you the beginning part of where we see John Mark. Jesus and all his disciples were in the upper room of a house. A lot of people believe, a lot of theologians believe it was actually John Mark's mother's home. And and her home had been used throughout scripture. We see even in the book of Acts, John Mark's mother, Mary, her house had been used multiple times for ministry, for prayer meetings, to host Uh, the the Last Supper, and all these other things. And so here's John Mark, and and John Mark had kind of followed Jesus and the ministry of Jesus and and was just really, like, he he really wanted to see what was going on and, and see what was happening, the interaction with Jesus and his disciples. And so he was a real curious kid, young man. And all of a sudden, Jesus and his disciples come to his house, and they're having this Last Supper in the upper room. And John Mark's listening and he's seeing what Jesus is doing and hearing what Jesus is saying. And it's so intriguing for him. And so, you know, I'm I'm sure it's bedtime and, and Mama Mary's like, John, it's time to go to bed. So John goes to bed and he's laying in bed and all of a sudden he, he hears the disciples putting everything away and they're off on their journey. He's like, I want to see what's going on. I want to see what's happening. And so the, the Bible says that, that he followed them. And, and we, we actually have thought to believe and enough proof to believe that what he did is he stayed in his pajamas and he snuck out of the house to follow. And here he is with his bed sheet over him, covering himself. And he's watching this. And all of a sudden they go to this place called the Garden of Gethsemane as he's following them. And, and he watches Jesus plead with his disciples, just pray for a little bit. I, just, I need you to pray. My, my heart is heavy and, is, and, heavy and he, he sees the heaviness and the weightiness upon Jesus and, and he sees this and he sees his disciples hear Jesus ask them to, to pray and seek and yet they fall asleep. And then he watches as he takes the, the three disciples, Peter, James, and John a little deeper and Jesus pleads with them, please stay awake and, and pray for a little bit longer. And they fall asleep and he watches as Jesus prays there at the rock. Lord, if it be your will, take this cup from me, but not my will, your will be done. And he sees all this going on and all of a sudden there shows up Roman guards. And this whole horde of people come to get Jesus and he watches Jesus get betrayed by Judas. He watches Judas give Jesus that kiss of betrayal. And he watches as as these men capture Jesus. And the Bible is so interesting. I want to read this for you because listen to what happens here in Mark chapter 14. This is amazing. In Mark chapter 14, 
verse 51, it says this, and a young man wearing nothing but a linen garment, that means his pajamas, was following Jesus. This is what, this is what the Bible says right here in the book of Mark, was following Jesus when they seized him. That means the guards saw this young man in the bush and be like, somebody go get him. And as they seized him, all of a sudden he fled. They grabbed his linen garment and he fled. And the Bible says he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Can I tell you something? John Mark was the first streaker in the Bible. Straight up ran naked home. You want to talk about embarrassing? This young man, the first mention of this young man <clears throat> is him being a streaker. Him running away, fleeing naked. You want to talk about being embarrassed? One day I <clears throat> was preaching at one of my friend's church. And I was at my friend's church and he's, I'm up there and I'm preaching with everything I have. And the, the, the audience seems so captivated, you know, like their eyes are on me and they're just, they won't take their eyes off me. And I'm just preaching with everything that I have. And in the name of Jesus, you know how sometimes I can get a, just a little bit animated and, uh, <clears throat> I'm all animated and I'm preaching with everything I have. And I'm just like, ah, and then I sit down and I'm, I'm so proud of myself. I'm just telling you, I'm so proud of myself. And I sit down and, and the pastor comes up. He's like, well, that was an awesome sermon. And you could tell like there was this awkwardness. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like this, like something that I was like, did I say something wrong? And I sit down and his assistant next to me looks at me and says, hey, bro, are you scared of heights? I said, no. I mean, the stage was high, but not that high. I said, are you scared of heights, bro? I'm like. No, he says, well, your zipper is. <laughs> Immediately, man, I realized something. My zipper was down the entire sermon. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm like preaching. I'm like, in the name of Jesus, I'm kicking stuff. I'm preaching like crazy. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I never wanted to preach again. I never wanted to preach again. Like, I, my career is over as a preacher. I'm going to be known as the zipper guy the next time I go to that church. I can never go back to that church. But you know what's crazy is this. In that moment, I want you to think about it. He's marked enough to find himself in one of the Gospels as the one who ran away and fled naked. And can I just tell you right now, that can be shameful. And many of us, one of the hindrances in us accomplishing what God has called us to is our lives are riddled with shame. Wow. We face shame all the time. Things that we've done in the past and things that people even know about. Things that people call us out on. I mean, I can, I can just tell you, I, I, I know for a fact because we've seen it with the disciples. I know for a fact there are probably some moments where Peter and John are laughing like, oh yeah, man, hey, 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 hey. You remember the time? <laughs> you remember the time at Mark? You remember he was wearing his tunic? And he got stripped naked and he was running home. Can, can you just see it? Ah! I'm telling you, in their little circles, they're making fun of this joker. You think I'm wrong. You think, oh, no, they're disciples. They're holy. Let me tell you something. Word gets out. <laughs> and Christians have the tendency to talk. Now, let me tell you why I'm making such a big deal. This is because this is his first, like I said, it's the first time you see Mark, but it, the first time you see him, it's a shameful thing. He very easily could have been gripped with shame and allowed that to determine his direction and who God called him to be. But you see with John Mark's life, some very unique things that happen. As we look at his backstory, I mean, check this out. He was actually in a ministry home. His mother's house was the house that when Peter got set free from prison miraculously and showed up at the door and knocked on the door, that was John Mark's mother's house. And, and that Peter would actually frequent there a lot because that, that was really where a lot of the church activity was happening. And John Mark was in the midst of that. So here's this young man that he knows ministry. He's been living around ministry. And then something incredible happens. He gets chosen to travel with Paul and Barnabas. Now, let me tell you something. That's amazing. He gets chosen to travel with Paul 
and Barnabas as their helper. Now here's this young man, and just think about this backstory. Here he is, someone that fled, someone that was a streaker, this embarrassing story that he had every right to be ashamed of, but yet he was grown up in ministry. He was in the house. He was familiar with it all. He understood ministry. He understood persecution. He understood problems, and he gets chosen to accompany Paul and Barnabas. And now he's on his journey, and we find ourselves at Acts 13, 13, where now the breakdown happens. Someone say the breakdown. Look at that person next to you and say the breakdown. Anyone here ever have a breakdown? Like everything's going good. Like you're like, okay, finally I got through this, this uh, streaking thing. Hmm. I finally got through this, but yet all of a sudden the breakdown happens. Everything's going good in your finances and the breakdown comes. Everything's going good in your marriage, but the breakdown comes. Everything's going good with your kids, but the breakdown happens. And here's John Mark and everything's going good. And then all of a sudden, this crazy conflict takes place, which I shared in the beginning. Here's this man, Bar Jesus, and there's this problem that's happening within the church and this major conflict happens and they get through it, but it shakes John Mark up to where the next port that they land at, John Mark's, I'm out of here. I'm going straight back to Jerusalem. Now, we don't know, and I'm going to be honest with you, there's a lot of speculation around why John Mark deserted Paul and Barnabas and went back to Jerusalem. But I want to, I want to kind of take you through this story. Can we kind of walk through the narrative of what took place as we see, number one, not only did he face shame in the past, but there's probably a lot of fear because of the conflict that they faced. They faced a lot of persecution. They faced trials and threats of imprisonment. And here's this young man, John Mark, right in the midst of it. Can you imagine being young and seeing this person manifest right in front of your eyes or, or see this problem or see all these people try and come and kill you? He wasn't just traveling with some other apostle. This is Paul the apostle, probably one of the most controversial apostles there was. I mean, this man was always in people's face. This man was bold and courageous and caused conflict everywhere he went. And now John Mark found himself in the midst of this conflict. So it could be, it could be that John Mark was afraid and had every right to be afraid. So maybe it was fear that drove him back to Jerusalem. Maybe it was politics. Huh. Politics. They say, well, pastor, how does, how does politics work? Something really interesting happens in the book of Acts. Let me share with you what happens. You guys still with me? What happens is in the beginning of ministry, it's Barnabas and Paul. And Barnabas, who really was the one that brought Paul to a place within the church and introduced him to everybody and, and really mentored Paul, started that journey. And it was, Paul, it was Barnabas and Paul that started on that mission. But then after... This moment with Bar Jesus and this incredible moment of deliverance, everything shifts. Listen to this. In one moment, it went from Barnabas and Paul to Acts 13 13. What does Acts 13 13 say? From Paphros, Paul and his companions. Something shifted. Wait a second. When did it go from Barnabas and Paul to now Paul and his companions? It's like the band, it's like the Beatles, right? All of a sudden it being like John whatever and the guys, right? This is exactly what happened. Now, this is where the problem lied. And a lot of people say, no, pastor, this can't happen. Did you know that there's politics in the church? Oh, <gasps> no way. We're sinful people. We're human. I'm just letting you know we're human. We don't mean for there to be politics, but sometimes politics can arise even within the church. You know one of the dilemmas that John Mark faced is he was Barnabas' cousin. And all of a sudden, now we're just speculating, all of a sudden the ministry changes from Barnabas and Paul. And the main reason I'm here is because of Barnabas, but now Paul's taking over and I'm just a companion. I'm, gonna, I'm an accompaniment. It's like, forget this. You know how many people I've met in the church that get derailed because of petty politics? <laughs> Don't look at me like that. You know what I'm talking about. Well, how come this guy got elevated and I didn't? I don't know. 
But is it really that big of a deal? And if you understood how hard I work, how come I'm working so hard and they, they don't work as hard as I do and they got, I don't know. But that's not what makes a difference to your destiny. Your destiny is not tied with other people being elevated. It is about you being obedient to the call of God. Listen, can I ask you this question? Are you where God has called you to be? Don't allow politics, petty politics in your life, in your business, on your job, in, in your church to derail you from the call of God on your life. We've got to make sure, friends, because listen, it's going to happen. Some people are going to get favor when they don't deserve it. There is something in Hawaii called nepotism, and it's real. They will hire somebody completely unqualified to be your boss because there's somebody's brother, sister's uncle's cousin's aunt, twice removed. They have the same nose as me. They have the same color skin as me, and so they get promoted. Don't look at me like that. Some of you have faced it. And so this is the problem. We get angry at God. We get angry at people. And we allow that situation, that circumstance to derail us from our destiny. Don't give into it. Don't give into it. You got to fight. You got to stay true to what God's called you to. There's a, we see even within John Mark's life, this this battle with being indecisive. I mean, you, you got to think about it. Here's Paul and Barnabas and they're ministering to Gentiles. That is Paul's ministry. Gentiles. John Mark's a Jew. He's used to Jews. And now he's having to minister. He was hurled into ministering to Gentiles. And there's this indecisiveness that took place in his heart. He's like, do I minister to Gentiles or do I minister to Jews, and that's what's unique about this story is it makes it very clear that John Mark went straight from where they were back to Jerusalem. He didn't pass go, he didn't collect $200, he went straight to Jerusalem, which gives us an idea of where his heart was. Many times we battle, we're indecisive in what God's called us to. And we have this internal wrestling. God, am I called here? Am I called there? I don't know. I don't know what to do. And we spend so much time vacillating between two positions in our life. When God wants us to make up our mind. God wants us to stay true to the call that he's given us. So can I tell you, a lot of us, we know that we're called by God, but we have certain desires in our heart. We have certain desires. And we wrestle with our desires and God's desires. And we allow our desires to take precedence over God's desires. It was no doubt that John Mark was called to travel with Paul and Barnabas. The elders prayed together and they sent them forth and chose John Mark to travel with Paul and Barnabas. But there was this part of his heart that said, I don't know. Am I truly called to this? He wrestled with it. Friends, you are, you are going to experience a wrestling in the midst of your call. There will be moments where you actually look at your abilities or your inabilities and question, am I capable of this? Am I even called to this? Why am I here? I'm a country bumpkin from Maui. Why am I in Oahu? You understand what I'm saying? And we wrestle with this. Obviously, this isn't for me. Obviously, I'm not going anywhere. Obviously, I'm not as fruitful. Maybe I'll be more fruitful here. Or maybe I'll be more fruitful there. And that wrestling has the potential to take us out of the will of God. But the last thing that we see, this is interesting as we speculate on what really took place, <clears throat> we wonder, we wonder if maybe, just maybe, John Mark was a little homesick. Poor little guy. He was a little homesick. He missed mama. Now we know for a fact that he was a mama's boy. But here's, here's John Mark. I'm a mama's boy, just letting you know. But you call me one, I'll whoop you. No, just joking. But you know, I, I don't know what it might have been, but we do realize this, that he made a decision to obey his comfort 
versus face his conflict. He made a decision to obey his comfort of being back home. I'm just going to go home. This is too much for me. He followed that desire for comfort versus face his conflicts. And I've seen it over and over and over again. Incredible, called, anointed men and women of God that choose comfort over facing their conflicts. We run away. We say, forget about it. You know what? I, I just, I, I think God's called me to be comfortable. I think, I think that's what I need to be. I need to be comfortable. No, it, it's not about your comfort. There is nothing in Jerusalem that John needed. He needed to stay true to the call of God on his life. But, but possibly there might have been this, this portion of his heart and his life where he said, this is uncomfortable for me. I'm out of here. Can I ask you this question? Are you willing to be tenacious? Are you willing to be bold and courageous that even though there are moments where it seems very uncomfortable, even though there are moments where it feels like all hell is breaking loose on you, you're like, I don't know if I can handle this. I don't know if I can handle one more moment. Can you stick in there and say, you know what? I know this isn't comfortable, but I'm not called to be comfortable. I'm called to be in the will and in the purposes of God. I know there's a lot of conflict right now, but that's all right. My God is in the business of resolving conflict. If I just stay true to my call, if I just stay true to my call, I'm not going to allow conflict. I'm not going to allow fear. I'm not going to allow politics to derail me anymore. I'm going to stay true to the call of God on my life. John Mark faces this incredible breakdown. He breaks down and he runs away. He runs away. But what's so remarkable is not only... Does he face politics? Not only does he face fear, not only does he face conflict, not only does he face comfortability and, and all these issues, but then finally to add on top of it, Barnabas is like, look, John Mark, I know you messed up, bro, but I, I want to have you back. Barnabas is like, I want you back, bro. And so Barnabas goes to, to Paul and he's like, hey, I'm bringing John Mark back on the scene. And Paul's like, keep that yellow belly no good. <laughs> Paul straight up rejects him. The apostle Paul says, I don't want him with us just to leave us again. Can you imagine being John Mark and getting rejected by the apostle Paul? Friends, I know rejection hurts and rejection hits deep. And it's hard to try and recover from rejection. Most of us in our life, we carry rejection with us everywhere we go. And most of us, I'm just talking about myself. Maybe I'll just say myself. I, I'm waiting for the next moment of rejection. It's almost like I step into a situation or to a relationship almost expecting rejection versus acceptance. There's people I know that they go from church to church to church experiencing rejection and so the worst part is they step into their next church just waiting for the next moment of rejection they step into that next relationship just waiting because they know it's going to happen because i've been rejected before it creates this internal conflict where now we carry rejection with us john mark gets rejected by paul and barnabas does something unique in the midst of John Mark's breakdown, Barnabas decides to do something. I'm sure it kind of went like this because the, the Bible says it got heated. It got heated. That's what the Bible says. It got heated. It got hot in there, hotter than it is in here. <laughs> the AC's getting fixed, I promise. It just, it just takes a while. It's a new one, and so it takes a while to work. Anyways, it gets heated. Can I just, I, I just, this is, I'm just, again, speculating. I wonder if, if Barnabas came to Paul and said, hey, you know, I got to tell you something. You were a Christian killer at one time, and all the elders were afraid of you. 
and they rejected you. But God gave me a name and my name is Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And I walked with you and I became a shield about you, Paul, as you were on your journey to become who God made you to be. And I stuck with you and I ministered to you and I mentored you and I even gave you position so much so that I put my position and my name on the side so that you could be elevated. Do you know what, Paul? As I did for you, I'm gonna do for him. And the Bible says that Barnabas went and followed John Mark back home and went with him. You know, I believe that every person here needs a mentor. I believe every person here needs someone in their life to encourage them. That's why we are bent on having you join a life group. Do you know why you need to be in a life group? Well, pastor, I don't have, ain't nobody got time for that. (laughs) Ain't nobody got time for that, pastor. I don't have time to go to somebody's house and talk about Jesus and have people get all up in my business. (laughs) Nobody got time for that. You have to have it. You need people all up in your business. (laughs) Really? Really, Pastor? Yeah, you need someone going, dude, what's wrong with you? Why are you acting like that? Why haven't I seen you in church in a couple weeks? Well, they don't need to know my business while I'm not at church. Yeah, they do. Why aren't you at church? Well, Pastor, if you understood, man, it is wave season. Let me tell you something about wave season. You need somebody to call you when you're not at church. You, need, you, you know why? Because the devil's trying to isolate you to keep you from your destiny. You need someone to follow up on you when you're going through craziness. You need someone to, to follow up. You need someone you can call when your marriage is going through it. And say like, bro, please pray for me. Well, my wife, man, I don't know what's going on. Oh, don't worry about it, bro. She, it's just, you know, she'll be over in a week. It's going to be okay. Just hold on for one more week. You need someone to encourage you through the storm. Are you guys with me? You guys are looking at me like I'm crazy. You need some encouragers in your life. You need a pastor to stand up in front of you and preach you a word, not that you designed, but that the Holy Ghost designed for you. Not that you want to hear, but that you need to hear I want to go to that church where the pastor preaches the words I want to hear good luck I don't I don't pray I don't pray all week long to go oh Lord what does the congregation want to hear I said Lord what do you want to say God what do they need to hear this week that's going to get them moving into their destiny and their purpose you need an encourager in your life And Barnabas joined with John Mark. He says, I'm coming with you. And he began to encourage John Mark. And this is what's awesome. This young man who was a disappointment. This young man who had every reason to be ashamed because of the background of his life and the breakdowns of his life. This man that was rejected by Paul the Apostle now joins Peter. Mm. You know that other reject? Joins Peter on his journey. And Peter and John Mark and a few others begin to travel together. And this is what's incredible. This young man who was rejected. This young man who faced conflict and ran away and and chose comfort over conflict. This young man who had someone that grabbed a hold of him and said, I'm going to mentor you and I'm going to help you. We're going to deal with this thing. Now begins to travel with Peter. And this is what's incredible. is as he's traveling with Peter, he's listening to Peter. He's listening to Peter preach and tell all these stories about Jesus. And John Mark, because of his gifting, he begins to write down everything Peter's saying. He's like, oh, that's good. Oh, Jesus did that. Jesus did this. Oh, Jesus did that. Did you know that the book of Mark, first of all, is the only book that tells a story of the naked streaker, but also doesn't mention Peter walking on water. Why? Because Peter wasn't bragging about himself. As a matter of fact, Peter didn't want to talk about that. That's not not where I want to go. But we know that in that time, this is what's awesome. John Mark begins to pen the gospel of Mark. And he begins to hear all these things about Jesus from Peter, straight from the words of Peter. Here's some secret moments. 
some things that he observed as they met in ministry at his house. Incredible. And it was so effective. Mark was so effective that even Luke, the physician, used the gospel of Mark as his reference in writing his gospel. It's incredible to me. And you know what's the, ba- the best part about this? Here's, this? here's this young man who had this major breakdown, but someone encouraged him. It's Pastor Dimitri, if you could come to the piano. He became the comeback kid. How, Pastor? Because in this moment, we see something remarkable happen. But the working of mentorship in his life produced fruit. Him traveling with Peter, and even in moments where he was imprisoned, he was imprisoned with Peter. He faced conflict head on and decided, I'm going to stay. He developed the stick to that he lacked before. I believe that God is moving us from a place to where we used to retreat, we're going to advance. When we used to run away and, and respond in fear, we're going to respond out of courage and see victory come. What's so profound about this is later on, near the end of Paul, the apostle's ministry, we see something amazing. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11 says this. Luke and Paul are traveling and all of a sudden, all their partners at once leave. One goes to another city, the other goes to another city and Demas, who's, a, who's traveling with Paul, falls away. Now that's gotta be heartbreaking for Paul. This is a young man who saw miracles, preached with Paul. I mean, he heard the ministry of Paul was in Paul's prayer times. And I mean, I, I don't know, I'd be a giant killer, right? If I, if, I was, if I was traveling with Paul, but here's this man who's traveling with Paul, sees all the miracles, but yet turns away for the world. He didn't just leave because he was scared. He turned away for the world. And in this moment of desperation, Listen to what Paul says. He says, get Mark. (laughs) Get Mark and bring him with me because he is helpful to me in my ministry. A young man that deserted him and abandoned him was so changed by the power of God that he became a helper. Paul, Paul called him a helper in ministry. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, he mentioned, he's mentioned at a, as a fellow prisoner. That means that John Mark was willing to go to prison with Paul. A fellow prisoner. Listen to this. The guy that was rejected, the guy that was good for nothing, the guy that abandoned them and deserted them in their time of need was now a helper, was now a fellow prisoner. In Philemon chapter 1, verse 24, he's mentioned as a fellow worker. Can I tell you what I love about that word worker? In its original context, it means carrier of the burden. (laughs) You can put some weight on me, Paul. I know I ran away before. I know I got scared before. I know that I, I chose to be comfortable instead of face my conflict before. But Paul, you know what? Put some weight on me, brother. I'm here for you. I'm a carrier of the burden. You know what's incredible about this story in in Catholic history is you read a lot of the history of some of the saints and you hear a very unusual story about a man named Mark the Evangelist where a lot of theologians believe are tied to this young man, John Mark, the writer of the Gospel of Mark. And they called him Mark the Evangelist because he went out and did incredible miracles and branched off. And the story goes that he was actually martyred in the city of Alexandria where he was preaching the gospel and he became the planter of the church in Alexandria. And you know how he died, how they said he died? Is it the same miracle that happened in the book of 
Ephesians or that happened there in Ephesus where all of a sudden these miracles broke out and the power of God showed up and Ephesus got radically changed that all the idol makers got shut down because no one was buying idols. They said the same thing was happening in Alexandria. There was an anointing on him. This man who was rejected, this man who was a deserter became a hero of the faith. I know many of us face some trying times. Many of us were ashamed of our past. And you know, a lot of us have a lot to be ashamed about, but I got news for you. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every single morning. Great is his faith. I know some of you have made some mistakes. I know some of you have been derailed from your vision and your call and your purpose. But friends, it's time to get back. It's time to get back in alignment to the destiny that God has over you. You're a person of destiny. You're called. You're chosen. You're a hero. And I refuse to look at you any other way. Don't get mad at me. When we, when we come before you and say, look, man, you gotta, we got to confront some of these issues. Why? You're a hero. That's right. God's called you for such a time as this. Don't get upset when you realize, man, there's more that God has for me. And people remind you. And you got a bunch of Barnabases in your life going, come on, man, you might have failed. But there's more that God has for you. Be encouraged that you have people that love you enough to confront you. Because you have destiny all over you. You're a hero. Come on, look at that person next to you and say, you're a hero.